It was a strange decision by DAZN and Golden Boy to have Canelo Kovalev on the same night as UFC 244. Perhaps they felt as though Canelo is such a big star that he would easily outshine the UFC and Dana White wouldn't really be much competition to them. But they changed their mind on the night of the fight because they delayed the ring walk for Canelo Kovalev in order to allow the UFC event on a different network to finish. And some people say it was a silly move to make because it made Canelo Kovalev as an event look weak and they wouldn't have gained many more subscribers by delaying the fight by whatever it was, an hour or two. Well, perhaps they weren't looking necessarily for more subscribers. Perhaps they were looking for peak viewing figures to try and see for their own records what Canelo can do against certain opponents. Because if there were people who are subscribed to the zone, they can watch a replay, right? So perhaps they wanted to go and watch UFC and then come back and watch the Canelo Kovalev fight maybe the next day. You know, so perhaps the zone were interested in seeing what peak viewing figures they could get for the event. And in order to do that, most accurately, they had to delay the uh, Canelo Kovalev start time in order to allow UFC to finish. So, you know, that happened. A lot of people in boxing are kicking up a stink about it and a fuss. Again, an unusual decision for Golden Boy and DAZN to go on the same night as UFC. They've got so many other weekends they could have done it. I don't know what that was all about. Some people are saying that the fight was very poorly promoted. Well, personally, I wasn't in the United States in the run-up to this fight, Canelo Kovalev. So I didn't see what billboards were up. I didn't see what trailers and adverts were running on the television and on the zone and on line in America. I didn't see any of that because I wasn't over in America. Okay, so those of us who were outside America in the run up to this fight, we should be a bit cautious before we say the fight was poorly promoted because honestly, we weren't exposed to the promotion. We were only exposed to the limited promotion from Sky and Sky weren't selling a pay-per-view and they bought the rights to the fight at relatively short notice, or at least announced the fight was going to be on Sky at relatively short notice. So they were never going to promote it very heavily. As far as the way DAZN promoted it in Golden Boy in the United States, again, if you're not in the United States, particularly if you're not in states that have a very high Mexican or Latino population, then you should probably reserve judgment in terms of saying the fight wasn't well promoted. Okay. Now there are other ways to find out if a fight was well promoted. Of course, one way is to see the viewing figures. The proof is in the pudding. If you're doing tremendous viewing figures, then it's probably indicative that the fight was promoted quite well. Well, the zone are very secretive about their viewing figures. I'm not aware of them releasing any of their viewing figures to the public yet. And of course, they're very secretive about their subscription numbers. So we may never get to find out how well Canelo Kovalev did in terms of viewership or uh, extra subscriptions. Um, another way, of course, would be, and, and some people are pointing this out, is to look at the attendance for the Canelo Kovalev weigh-in, which was apparently a lot less than it normally is. So that's one of the few bits that we can go on as people outside of the United States. Now, as far as the shame of Canelo having to delay his fight or the zone golden boy delaying the Canelo fight in order to accommodate the UFC. And they say it's extra shameful because the two fighters involved in the UFC event, main event, uh, had 13 losses and 12 losses apiece. So for Canelo to be bowing down to them is shocking. This is the biggest star in boxing. Well, I think it's an unfair comparison because they're two different sports and the attitude that both fan bases have, the, the Canelo boxing fans and the UFC fans, the attitude they have is different towards losses. If Masvidal and Diaz were boxers and they were competing in a boxing match and they both had 13 losses and 12 losses apiece, they wouldn't be pay-per-view headliners because in boxing, losses are looked upon 
a lot more harshly than they are in MMA. For better or for worse, some people feel like it's sad that in boxing we look at losses so harshly, um, but that's just the way it is. So again, in MMA, you can have 12, 13 losses and still be looked upon as a star, still be looked upon as the best or one of the best in your division. Whereas in boxing, that's very rarely the case. Okay? If you've got 12, 13 losses, more often than not, you're written off as over the hill or even a journeyman. So bear that in mind. Furthermore, the Canelo Kovalev fight was not a grudge match. And in fact, the majority of Canelo fans are casuals. Okay, they're Mexican casuals. Of course, there are Mexican hardcore Canelo fans too. But the majority of his fans are Mexican casuals, same way that the majority of Anthony Joshua fans are British casuals. You do get some hardcore boxing fans who uh, are fans of Joshua as well, yes. But the majority of them are casuals. The majority of Canelo's fans are Mexican casuals. And as such, many of them, perhaps even most of them, wouldn't have been very familiar with Sergei Kovalev. There was no narrative, there was no rivalry between Canelo and Kovalev in the lead up to this fight. In fact, there wasn't even much time to promote the fight because the fight was signed very shortly after Kovalev beat Yard in his mandatory defense. They signed the Canelo fight and then just had a few weeks to promote it. And a lot of the Canelo fans were thinking, who is this Kovalev guy? They probably did a little research. Oh, he got knocked out by Ward. He got knocked out by Alida Alvarez. Is this really a great fight? Yeah, he's jumping up two weight divisions, but I mean, he nearly got uh, stopped in his last fight. You understand? There wasn't a narrative. There wasn't a rivalry. It's not like Canelo and Golovkin, where that rivalry was building for several years. Can uh, Golovkin, excuse me, was pandering to the Mexican crowd, talking about Mexican style and all this kind of stuff. And his trainer at the time, Abel Sanchez, a Mexican himself, was doing a lot of the promotion online for Golovkin. So as a team, they built this rivalry with Canelo over a number of years until they finally stepped in the ring. That's why those fights did so well at the box office. Whereas with Canelo Kovalev, that rivalry wasn't there. So I'm sure the numbers that they did were still strong, but weren't as strong as they could have been if he had a, a recognizable rival for his fans to latch onto and a narrative behind it, like a grudge behind it. There wasn't any of that. They were both very respectful to each other in the build up to the fight. You see? Whereas with the UFC event, it was a grudge match. There was a narrative. The MMA fans, the UFC fans, they knew all about the narrative going into this fight. They believed in it. They bought into it. You understand? So it's two very different situations. You can't It'll compare a grudge match like this between two fighters who are very well known to the target audience to this fight here where it's not a grudge match. There hasn't been that much time to promote it. Only Canelo is well known to the target audience. You understand? So yeah, I, I don't think it's the, the greatest comparison people are making. And I think people are going a little overboard in terms of... Uh, criticizing how well the fight was was promoted because you have to take all these factors into account. Could it have been promoted better? I'm sure it could, right? There's always room for improvement, but I'd prefer to hear from people in America. And I'm sure there are people in America who will say the fight was promoted poorly. And there might be some other people saying, oh, the fight was promoted okay, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I'll say about it. End of the day, Canelo is a superstar. And just to sh put, you know, show you guys the reality of the situation and put things in perspective, the winner of the UFC uh, main event the other night, Jorge Masvidal, is calling out Canelo. So for all those people saying Canelo had to bow down to the UFC and play second fiddle to them, he's not the one calling out Masvidal to have a boxing match with him. No. Masvidal is calling Canelo out, saying he will step into a boxing ring to fight Canelo. He's saying he's very serious. 
You can see him here. He says, I'm dead serious about trying to fight Canelo Alvarez. Give me a nice little change. I'll take my talents over there. I feel I can shock the world. Is Canelo a better boxer than me? Has he thrown 10,000 more jabs than me? Because that's what he does morning and night. Yeah, he's a better boxer, but I can bring some elements that boxers ain't used to that are in the legal realm of boxing and throw Canelo com completely off his game. He goes on. So if Masvidal and UFC was so much bigger than the Canelo event, why is Masvidal begging Canelo for a fight in boxing? He's not saying Can Canelo come over here to UFC. No, he's saying I'll come to where you're at Canelo and I'll fight you. <laughs> I guess it's partly indicative of the fact that Canelo is earning a hell of a lot more money than Masvidal's earning. And that is partly to do with the structure of the UFC as compared to the structure of boxing. If you are the star in boxing, other than the network, you are taking home the vast majority of the money if you're the star. Whereas in UFC, that's not the case. So Canelo, for example, is going to take, take home a lot more money or any pay-per-view star than their promoter will because their promoter gets a percentage of what they get. 20%, whatever it is, but the bulk of it goes to the fighter. The biggest uh, benefactor other than the fighter is going to be the television network. In this case, the zone. Okay, we don't know how much the zone have made from the Canelo fight. Again, it's a, not a pay-per-view platform, so it's more difficult to estimate. On a pay-per-view platform, there are numbers out there. I believe the television network takes like, I don't know, 50% of the revenue, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, uh, other than the, the television network, the fighter, who, as long as you're a star like Canelo, you're getting the bulk of the revenue. In UFC, not the same. <laughs> UFC, the fighters are getting relative chicken change compared to what the promoters get in and the network's getting and all that kind of stuff. So you've still got the likes of Mas Na Masvidal begging Canelo for a fight. I mean, he would get destroyed by Canelo. He says he's a bigger guy and it's not... <laughs> Come on, people. We know what's going to happen if he fights Canelo in a boxing match. He's going to get lit up like a Christmas tree. But yet... And he knows that too, deep down in his heart. But yet he's still begging for that fight because he wants that bag. He's not getting that kind of money in UFC. As, as successful as you think that event was, it wasn't as successful as, as he wished it was. Because he's not getting the kind of money Canelo's getting. So, anyway, that's my thoughts on the uh, scandal, if you want to call it that, to do with the Canelo Kovalev versus the UFC 244 event. You know, people are talking about the president. You know, Donald Trump was at the UFC event. I mean, people, you can get whoever you want at your event. There were stars at the Canelo event, right? Wasn't uh, Evander Holyfield there? Didn't you have Tweedledum and Tweedledee there? <laughs> Javonta Davis and Adrian Broner, the world star kings. It's not the same as the president, but I mean, to be honest, it's not too far different from the president. <laughs> it's all, when I think about it for a second, not too different. Tweedledum and Tweedledee and Trump. Uh, so yeah, that really doesn't mean too much. I mean, oh, Roberto Duran was there and The Rock was there. <laughs> People... Celebrities turn up to boxing matches all the time. That's not necessarily indicative that this event is better than that one or this, that, and the other. It is what it is. Roberto Duran was at a UFC event. Holyfield was at a boxing event. You know, it is what it is. And of course, after the Canelo fight, well, everybody's calling Canelo out. It's not just Masvidal. Bivol's calling him out. He'll go down to 168. Billy Joe's calling him out. Everybody's calling him out. So he's still the man in boxing, Canelo Alvarez. Oh, sorry, before I go, one of the reasons, and this is just, you know, me speculating, theorizing, but one of the reasons why having multiple losses in MMA is not frowned upon as much as it is in boxing, one of the reasons could be the fact that boxers take a lot more uh, punches to the head than MMA fighters do on average. Boxers are constantly getting hit in the head and their brain is being damaged. 
That's what happens when you get hit in the head. People think about brain damage and they think, well, blood clots on the brain and all that kind of stuff. No, a concussion is brain damage. Every time you get hit, you're losing brain cells. And fighters over the course of a career, boxers are getting hit thousands and thousands, maybe even millions of times. If you combine sparring with their fights, amateur and pro, probably millions of times they're getting hit in the head. Okay, so, a f a a a and getting hit in the head a lot ages you. It affects your motor functions the more you get hit in the head. Guys in MMA don't get hit in the head that much. So having 13 losses in MMA doesn't necessarily mean that your brains are scrambled. Whereas if you've got 13 losses in boxing, there's a good chance that you've taken a hell of a lot of blows to the head and your brains maybe are scrambled. So perhaps, of course, with MMA guys, they've got to think about, you know, rotator cuffs and injuries to their body, their limbs and torso and stuff like that, more so than in boxing. That's true. Um, but because MMA is more... Uh, accommodate into different styles of fighting. You know, some people are jujitsu guys. Some people are stand-up guys. Some people, you know, more with the wrestling or more with the boxing or the kickboxing or et cetera, et cetera. If you injure yourself in a particular way in MMA, you can switch over and start doing something else. There's more scope for you to adapt and, you know, basically uh, work around your injury. Whereas in boxing, there's not much scope for that. You got you, you're limited to using your hands and that's it. So if you mess up a shoulder, well, you're done. You can't then focus more on kicking, <laughs> you know, if your reflexes are not quite what they used to be as a boxer, well, you can't concentrate on your ground game rather than your stand up game. You're far more limited in boxing. Okay. So again, a boxer with 13 losses is probably more damaged in terms of his brain, than an MMA fighter with 13 losses. So that may be one of several reasons as to why losses are not seen as uh, so detrimental or su such a, th th they're not frowned upon so much in MMA as they are in boxing. Of course, one of the things people are going to bring up is the Floyd Mayweather effect. The fact that Mayweather promoted himself by constantly talking about his unbeaten record and that the knock-on from that was that other fighters tried to emulate what Floyd was doing. And the fans started following this. The fans started acting like, well, if you've taken a loss, you're trash. Because Mayweather was seen as the standard, right? He's supposed to be undefeated. If you show any weakness... And, you know, a loss is a weakness. Well, you know, good, we can write you off. And there is an element of that too. But I think it's a conjunction. It's a com combination of lots of different elements. So, um, you know, that's what I think. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. It's happening. I'm out. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. It's happening. I'm out. Join me on Patreon. I upload a minimum of two podcasts every single week, covering a wide variety of controversial topics, as well as live stream Q&A sessions. Take a look on screen right now at some of the podcasts I've produced so far. For just $3 a month, the equivalent of about £2 a month, you get access to all my new podcasts and my entire back catalogue of past podcasts, including my popular Confessions of a Nightclub Bouncer series. You can listen on your computer or on your smartphone or tablet by downloading the Patreon app from the Google Play Store or the App Store for free. The Patreon app also allows you to download each podcast in MP3. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, you get access to dozens of hours of exclusive content. It's easy to sign up, there's no contract, and you can cancel at any time. So come and join our community of free and critical thinkers by signing up with me here on Patreon today.